Chapter 2 of Badge of Infamy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey. Read by Stephen H. Wilson of Prometheus Radio Theater. www.prometheusradiotheater.com. 2. Lobby Feldman had set his legs the problem of heading for the great spaceport and escape from Earth, and he let them take him without further guidance. His mind was wrapped up in a whirl of the past, his past and that of the whole planet. Both pasts had in common the growth and sudden ruin of idealism. Idealism. Throughout history some men had sought the ideal, and most had called it freedom, only fools expected absolute freedom, but wise men dreamed up many systems of relative freedom, including democracy. They had tried that in America as the last fling of the dream. It had been a good attempt, too. The men who drew the Constitution had been pretty practical dreamers. They came to their task after a bitter war and a worse period of wild chaos, and they had learned where idealism stopped and idiocy began. They set up a republic, with all the elements of democracy that they considered safe. It had worked well enough to make America the number one power of the world, but the men who followed the framers of the new plan were a different sort, without the knowledge of practical limits. The privileges their ancestors had earned in blood and care became automatic rights. Practical men tried to explain that there were no such rights, that each generation had to pay for its rights with responsibility. That kind of talk didn't get far. People wanted to hear about rights, not about duties. They took the phrase that all men were created equal and left out the implied kicker that equality was in the sight of God and before the law. They wanted an equality with the greatest men without giving up their drive toward mediocrity, and they meant to have it. In a way, they got it. They got the vote extended to everyone. The man on subsidy or public dole could vote to demand more, the man who read of nothing beyond sex crimes could vote on the great political issues of the world. No ability was needed for his vote. In fact, he was assured that voting alone was enough to make him a fine and noble citizen. He loved that, if he bothered to vote at all that year. He became a great man by listing his unthought, hungry desire for someone to take care of him without responsibility. So he went out and voted for the man who promised him most, or who looked most like what his limited dreams felt to be a father image, or son image, or hero image. He never bothered later to see how the men he'd elected had handled the jobs he had given them. Someone had to look, of course, and someone did. Organized special interests stepped in where the mob had failed. Lobbies grew up. There had always been pressure groups, but now they developed into a third arm of the government. The old farm lobby was unbeatable, the big farmers shaped the laws they wanted. They convinced the little farmers it was for the good of all, and they made the story stick well enough to swing the farm vote. They made the laws when it came to food and crops. The last of the great lobbies was space, probably. It was an accident that grew up so fast it never even knew it wasn't a real part of the government. It developed during a period of chaos, when another country called Russia got the first hunk of metal above the atmosphere and when the representatives who had been picked for everything but their grasp of science and government went into panic over a myth of national prestige. The space effort was turned over to the aircraft industry, which had never been able to manage itself successfully except under the stimulus of war or a threat of war. The failing airplane industry became the space combine overnight, and nobody kept track of how big it was except a few sharp operators. They worked out a system of subcontracts that spread the profits so wide that hardly a company of any size in the country wasn't getting a share. Thus, a lot of patriotic, noble voters got their pay from companies in the lobby block and could be panicked by the lobby at the first mention of recession. So Space Lobby took over completely in its own field. It developed enough pressure to get whatever appropriations it wanted, even over presidential veto. It created the only space experts, which meant that the men placed in government agencies to regulate it came from its own ranks. The other lobbies learned a lot from space.
There had been a medical lobby long before, but it had been a conservative group, mostly concerned with protecting medical autonomy and ethics. It also tried to prevent government control of treatment and payment, feeling that it couldn't trust the people to know where to stop. But its history was a long series of retreats. It fought what it called socialized medicine. But the people wanted their troubles handled free, which meant by government spending, since that could be added to the national debt and thus didn't seem to cost anything. It lost, and eventually the government paid most medical costs without doctors working on a fixed fee. Then quantity of treatment paid, rather than quality. Competence no longer mattered so much. The lobby lost, but didn't know it, because the lowered standards of competence in the profession lowered the caliber of men running the political aspects of that profession as exemplified by the lobby. It took a worldwide plague to turn the tide. The plague began in old China. Anything could start there, with more than a billion people huddled in one area and a few madmen planning to conquer the world. It might have been a laboratory mutation, but nobody could prove it. It wiped out two billion people, depopulated Africa and most of Asia, and wrecked Europe, leaving only America comparatively safe to take over. An obscure scientist in one of the laboratories run by the medical lobby found a cure before the first waves of the epidemic hit America. Rutherford Ryan, then head of the lobby, made sure that medical lobby got all the credit. By the time the world recovered, America ran it, and the medical lobby was untouchable. Ryan made a deal with space lobby, and the two effectively ran the world. None of the smaller lobbies could buck them, and neither could the government. There was still a president and a congress, as there had been a senate under the Roman Caesars. But the two lobbies ran themselves as they chose. The real government had become a kind of oligarchy, as it always did after too much false democracy ruined the ideals of real and practical self-rule. A man belonged to his lobby, just as a serf had belonged to his feudal landlord. It was a safe world now. Maybe progress had been halted at about the level of 1980, but so long as the citizens didn't break the rules of their lobbies, they had very little to worry about. For that, for security and the right not to think, most people were willing to leave well enough alone. Some rules seemed harsh, of course, such as the law that all operations had to be performed in lobby hospitals. But that could be justified. It was the only safe kind of surgery, and the only way to make sure there was no unsupervised experimentation such as that which supposedly caused the plague. The rule was now an absolute ethic of medicine. It also made for better fees. Feldman's father had stuck by the rule, but had questioned it. Feldman learned not to question in medical school. He scored second in medical ethics only to Christina Ryan. He had never figured why she singled him out for her attentions, but he gloried in both those attentions and the results. He became automatically a rising young man, the favorite of the daughter of the lobby president. He went through internship without a sign of trouble. Chris humored him in his desire to spend three years of practice in a poor section loaded with disease, and her father approved. Such selfless dedication was the perfect image projection for a future son-in-law. In return, he agreed to follow that period by becoming an administrator, a doctor's doctor, as they put it. They were married in April, and his office was ready in May, complete with a staff of 80. The publicity releases had gone out, and the public relations lobby that handled news and education was paid to begin the greatest build-up any young genius ever had. They celebrated that with a little party of some 400 people and reporters at Ryan's Lodge in Canada. It was to be a gala weekend. It was then that Baxter shot himself. Baxter had been Feldman's closest friend in the lobby. He'd come along to handle press relations and had gotten romantic about the countryside, never having been out of a city before. He hired a guide and went hunting, 80 miles beyond the last outpost of civilization. Somehow, he got his hand on a gun, though only guides were supposed to touch them, managed to overcome its safety devices, and then pulled the trigger with the gun pointed the wrong way. Chris, Feldman, and Harnett from Public Relations had accompanied him on the trip. They were sitting in a nearby car while Feldman enjoyed the scenery. Chris made further plans, and Harnett gathered material. There was also a photographer and writer 
but they hadn't been introduced by name. Feldman reached Baxter first. The man was moaning and scared, and he was bleeding profusely. Only a miracle had saved him from instant death. The bullet had struck a rib, been deflected and robbed of some of its energy, and had barely reached the heart. But it had pierced the pericardium, as best Feldman could guess, and it could be fatal at any moment. He reached for a probe without thinking. Chris knocked his hand aside. She was right, of course. He couldn't operate outside a hospital. But they had no phone in the lodge where the guide lived, and no way to summon an ambulance. They'd have to drive Baxter back in the car, which would almost certainly result in his death. When Feldman seemed uncertain, Harnett had given his warning in a low but vehement voice. You touch him, Dan, and I'll spread it in every one of our media. I'll have to. It's the only way to retain public confidence. There'd be a leak, with all the guides and others here, and we can't afford that. I like you. You have color. But touch that wound, and I'll crucify you. Chris added her own threats. She'd spent years making him the outlet for all her ambitions, denied because women were still only second-rate members of medical lobby. She couldn't let it go now. And she was probably genuinely shocked. Baxter groaned again and started to bleed more profusely. There wasn't much equipment. Feldman operated with a pocket knife sterilized in a bottle of expensive scotch and only anodyne tablets in place of anesthesia. He got the bullet out and sewed up the wound with a bit of surgical thread he'd been using to tie up a torn good luck emblem. The photographer and writer recorded the whole thing. Chris swore harshly and beat her fists against the bowl of a tree. But Baxter lived. He recovered completely and was shocked at the heinous thing that had been done to him. They crucified Feldman. End Recording